Hello, I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin of the New York Times, and it's the economy, New York. What's happening and what it means to you. Welcome to our debut program. Over the next seven broadcasts, we'll speak with business leaders, politicians, newsmakers, and you, all in an effort to make sense of one of the most chaotic economic times in our history. Tonight, our guests include former Time Warner CEO Richard Parsons, the publisher of Forbes magazine, Steve Forbes, and forensic investigator Ellen Zamilis, who has some ideas on how to track down some of that money Bernie Madoff allegedly stole. But first, New York Governor David Patterson delivered a grim State of the State address and made clear that we have tremendous challenges ahead. We will sacrifice what we want today in order to achieve what we need tomorrow. A man who has been involved in city, state, and national politics is Richard Parsons. Parsons just stepped down as chairman of Time Warner, the world's largest media company, and is a director of Citigroup, which happens to be in the news. He's also an economic advisor to the incoming President Barack Obama. Mr. Parson joins us now. Thank you, Dick, for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Andrew. Tell me where we are. How bad is it? Well, economically, I think it's, I think it's pretty bad. I think that, uh, that uh, Governor Patterson, uh, as well as, as Mayor Bloomberg here in New York, have both put their arms around it and, and understand this is more than just a cyclical downturn. I mean, the state is looking at a $15 billion deficit uh, for the coming fiscal year. And when you, when you think about the fact that only about, I don't know, 65 or so billion of what is in the state's right. $120 billion budget is actually state money. The rest comes from the feds. That's almost 25 percent he's got to find to make up and close that difference. So you heard they're looking at $9.5, $10 billion of cuts. And uh, he's going to have to do something with, with one-timers and taxes to make up the other $5 billion to to balance the budget as he's required right. to under the law. So, I mean, those are serious numbers. Those are very serious numbers. In the city, it's, it's not quite as bad, but I don't know, it's four or five billion dollar deficit when, next when year. When you think about what's happened in the city, mm -hmm. 250,000 jobs in the financial services sector, how do we get those jobs back? Do we get those jobs back? What is going to change and how is the city going to change? Well, I think uh, over time you get those jobs back, but it's going to be over time. You can't, you can't make it up uh, as quickly as they went away. You have to think about a bubble, uh, almost like blowing up a balloon. You know, you could spend 15 minutes blowing up a balloon, blowing up, but when it pops, it pops like that. And that's what's happened to the economy. I mean, the, the balloon popped. Uh, and so one of the reasons that we have these deficits is because the, uh, there's going to be revenue shortfall. Those 250,000 people who are out of work paid taxes, spent money in the city, helping other people make money on which they pay taxes, that's all gone now. It's going to be gone for a couple, three, four years. So this is really structural. This is right. not cyclical. You said three or four years. What happens in three or four years? And, and, and what makes up that shortfall? Because some people would say that Wall Street, as we know it, is over. It's changed well, fundamentally. No. Well, well, it may have changed fundamentally, or it may change fundamentally. In other words, the mono Shrunken lines, them. the mono lines like the, 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 the broker dealers, right. the Bear Stearns, the they really aren't anymore. I mean, right. the last two are Goldman Sachs and, and Morgan Stanley, and they've become bank holding companies. Mm -hmm. So the street will change, but the need for financial intermediation won't. There will be banks, there will be intermediaries, there will be investment advisory people. Uh, the Exactly how those services are delivered and in what organizational structural form will change over time. But the need for that kind of sophisticated financial advice intermediation and, and, and service will continue to exist and New York will continue to be, over the long haul, one of the world centers where it happens. You have been and are uh, the lead director for Citigroup, uh, a company that has obviously uh, had a, a tough time. Uh, the government's stepped in, uh, paid $45 billion, backstop another $300 billion. Um, now that taxpayers happen to be shareholders of the company. When you think about corporate governance in your role, has it changed? I, I wouldn't say that it's changed. It's just it has, uh, uh, it has new attitude, is the way I'd, I'd, I'd say it. Because the directors obviously serve uh, the interests of and, behest of, and at, 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 at the sufferance of the shareholders. And now the public is a part of the mm -hmm. shareholder group. Uh, and that only, what that means is more scrutiny, more, and, and, and we have to respond mm -hmm. by more transparency, um, and 
also, when you're dealing with taxpayer dollars, um, not every one of those taxpayers sort of stepped up to be a shareholder. Right. All our other shareholders made a choice, right? right? Well, I want to own the stock. The taxpayers, some of them are in there, not not mm -hmm. against their will, but not not as a matter of free will. So that we're we're quite aware of the fact that we uh, in, uh, have to form an even closer working relationship with our regulators and have to be that much more scrupulous. Not scrupulous isn't the right word because we're always scrupulous. That more, much more sensitive to not only the reality but the appearance of things. What do you tell the New Yorker on the street, or frankly any taxpayer, when he comes up to you and says, "What happened here?" Boy, that's a that's a, it's a big question. Because you know this, and I think this is frankly one of the one of the problems. They're mad, we're, right? They're not they're not happy campers. We're we're facing now. No one has actually explained to the American people how did we get in this mess? What happened? They they don't understand it. So they don't understand not only that you know why is Citigroup getting this money or why did uh, uh, car companies get that money or why did AIG get the money? They don't understand the whole thing, and and you know you try and explain kind of what the antecedents of the problem were and how both large um, and rare this kind of perfect storm, right. economic storm is. And as a board member though, do you, do you apologize to the taxpayer? Do you say, I'm responsible, there's an accountability issue? How do, you, how do you think about that? You know, now, the reality is, as you said, the taxpayers are now shareholders right. in Citigroup along with a bunch of other shareholders. Right. I think in the fullness of time as we work our way through this, the taxpayers are going to be fine. Taxpayers may even make a little money. Right. Uh, so, no, we don't apologize, or at least I don't apologize. Um, but I do try, when asked, to help people understand kind of what's at stake, you know, because people say, well, why, you know, why, you know if I ran my business uh, off the side of the road, I don't know that the government would come and help me. I don't know how frequently it right. does. But, but, you know, these large, um, global, interconnected financial institutions are next to the heartbeat of any modern economy. You can't have a modern economy in a modern country without a properly functioning banking and financial intermediary system, which is why I said earlier that New York will continue to, to play a role on a global basis. And so it's in everybody's interest to keep them functioning and keep the markets open because, you know, that's how I fund my business and that's how people fund their lives and they need these institutions. Well, on a national basis, you are an economic advisor uh, to the next president. What do you tell him he needs to do? Well, one of the things, the last time we met, I, I suggested him that the high priority is, is just explaining to the American people how we got here, what it means, and how we're going to get out of this. Uh, because I think if people have an understanding, that's the basis for, 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 for then you know, sort of coming down off the ceiling and sort of saying, right. okay, I got the picture now and I see the plan and I either can buy into it or here's how we modify it or here's how I fit. So, and I think the incoming president is, um, uh, I, won't, I won't use the term they, they, they use for Ronald Reagan, the great right. communicator, but one of his many great strengths is he can communicate to people directly, clearly, uh, make complicated things simple. Uh, the other thing, and he's, he's basically said it's been the papers every day. I mean, he, he recognizes that this is a very substantial uh, disruption right. and that, that it's going to take quick and very massive uh, response to get the engines turned over again. And I think that the program he's outlined of, uh, of starting with a substantial stimulus package that's built on, on what he calls down payments on long-term initiatives, mm -hmm. infrastructure, right energy, you know, a rational energy policy, for health care, making big down payments up front will help get this economy back on track. And finally, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, uh, the rumor du jour is that uh, uh, you may be uh, up for the uh, Secretary of Commerce role now that Richardson uh, has dropped out. You know, it's, it's very say? flattering to be considered uh, um, worthy to be a part of the, the incoming administration. I'm very a big fan of, of the incoming president, but uh, alas, it's not true. Fair enough. Thank you, Dick, and thank you for being our first guest on the show. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you so much. Coming up, we're going to be speaking with magazine publisher Steve Forbes on his take on bailouts and taxes. <music> Steve Forbes is one of the most recognizable business leaders in the nation. 
The former Republican presidential candidate has been speaking out on the federal bailouts and on one of his favorite topics, taxes. What does he expect from the president-elect? Mr. Forbes joins us now. Thank you so much for joining us, Steve. Good to be with you, Andrew. Thank you. So I've always thought of you as a a free marketeer, if you will. When I think of Forbes, I think of the, the phrase capitalist tool. And here we are after a year of bailouts. We had Citigroup, we've had AIG. And from what I understand, you've been a supporter of some of these bailouts. How does well, that square? Uh, well, it, it squares in the sense that the government uh, helped create the crisis, uh, debasing the dollar, Freddie and Fannie, and uh, Mark to Market, and some of the other egregious mistakes they've made, removing road barriers to uh, short sellers. So they created the crisis or helped create the so crisis. So we're blaming the government for some of this. Oh, more than blaming the government. If the government hadn't made the mistakes it made, this bubble, this mania could never have reached the size it did. If Fannie and Freddie hadn't bought $1.6 trillion of this garbage, they could have never written and so, c- so engaged you, in the so corruption you think of they this did. So you think of this as a regulation issue? I think of this as government not realizing, one, you have to have a strong and stable dollar instead of treating it like confetti. Right. And, uh, and number two, you don't have two entities that bring out the worst in the government and the private sector, Freddie and Fannie. Mm-hmm. When we think about bailouts, though, and here we have the $700 billion TARP, we probably have more money coming to save the auto industry in March and already a little bit now. Well, they're, they're, they're... How do you justify that? Well, you justify in terms of the uh, original TARP, which was put in to get the system out of cardiac right. arrest, by the middle of September, letting Lehman go, then deciding to save AIG, before that, uh, saving Bear Stearns, but then uh, wiping out uh, the preferred shareholders of Fannie and Freddie, going all over right. the place, utter inconsistencies. The market just seized up. When the market seizes up and you have a massive innocent businesses that are going to get destroyed because without credit, the body, the economic body, dies. You had to do something cardiac arrest. Right. So it's like a natural disaster. When a natural disaster strikes, you throw in the food, you throw in the medicine, clean water, temporary shelter. It doesn't mean you do it forever. Now, the danger now is they're doing it for everybody. On the auto industry, for example, uh, not putting in real conditions. Are you a supporter of the auto industry being bailed out? I'm a supporter of uh, the auto industry getting help with real conditions, okay. including the UAW. Mm-hmm. They, uh, the, sadly, it looks like uh, the, the White House undermined Senator Corker of Tennessee's efforts to get real conditions where everybody puts things on the table. After all, for the auto companies, the, right. the shareholders have been wiped out. The bondholders know they're going to lose two-thirds of their money. So everyone's going to have to put something on the table, and then you can work it out. You don't have to go to bankruptcy court to do it. You can do that in advance. And so... When we look at the execution of the TARP, do we think that it's working? Uh, it's not working, uh, one, because they don't have any uh, open criteria of who is eligible. So who, who's going to get it when you apply for it? I know a lot of banks are applying for it. Well, we it. have kept the patient from dying, right? We've if kept if the, the goal was to dying. keep the patient from dying. So, so, so they right. save the patient. Solving this thing is not that difficult. Get rid of mark to market. Start mm-hmm. over. Realize the way it's been applied is, is berserk. Tell the auditors and the regulators, get off the bank, backs of banks. Let them rebuild their capital so they can lend again. And then let me propose something that's going to sound uh, strange again coming from a Republican, okay. but on the housing market. Mm-hmm. Right now, Treasury can borrow 30-year money at 3%. Right. So why not, since they Pretty own, uh, since they own Fannie and Freddie, mm-hmm. uh, they pretend they don't, conservatorship, get mm-hmm. over it. Th- that virginity is over. Uh, they own them. And so uh, why not give the guarantee formally to Fannie and Freddie instead of saying, well, we'll make sure they can pay their bonds off, blah, blah, blah. No, give the explicit guarantee temporarily on the condition that Fannie and Freddie then borrow at three. Go to the banks and say, banks, we will buy fixed rate mortgages from you that you write. People come and refinance or new mortgages at fixed rates of four and a half, five percent. You can borrow 10-year right. money at two and a half. And, and, they still make and, the and spread. That would, and that would help and, the housing and, market uh, tremendously. Get the housing market moving again. Barack Obama is going to be in office in a couple of weeks. Um, What do you think of his stimulus plan, um, and does it go far enough, frankly? Well, I think on the the spending side, they're suddenly discovering you can't spend uh, productively uh, X hundreds of billions of dollars. Now, you can make a case, national electricity grid, we need one. That would save tons of electricity. 20 or 30 billion to re- relieve congestion in cities, not bridges to nowhere. Sensible spending like that would do good, long-term structural stuff. 
But uh, the rest of it, you know what's going to happen. And the one good thing is I'm glad that they re at least realize now conceptually they need tax cuts. I think right. the way they've done it is not going to be productive. What's wrong with the tax cuts? Well, it, it's rebates. $500 for every individual, 1000 for couples. It's, it's, That's it's what rebates. they're thinking about. It's rebates. It doesn't change incentives. The whole point of a tax cut, whether the way Kennedy did it, the way Reagan did it, the way the Bushies did it in 203 in a mild way, you reduce tax rates, you increase incentives, you get more risk-taking, more but, but, job but creation. But haven't we seen over and over again that, that the trickle-down doesn't really work? I mean, haven't, haven't the studies trickle produced up. When you reduce capital gains taxes, you create more businesses. A trickle-up, a trickle-down was an apple when uh, Steve Jobs did that, when uh, Bill Gates did uh, Microsoft, Larry Ellison did his thing, what uh, they did with Google. That wasn't, that, that, that's innovation. You want to encourage innovation. That's how you move ahead. Writing people's checks, Japan did that in the 90s. It doesn't work. So you get, you, so right. you get your 500 or 1,000 bucks. What's the encore? And uh, so you got to change incentives. And if they don't like the rich, then take the 25% middle class tax rate and reduce that permanently to 15. That'll right. do some good. Finally, what do you worry about most right now? I worry that we'll continue to make the same kind of mistakes that we made in the past year and a half, well-intentioned people end up doing disastrous things, and we get a long drought like we had in the 70s, even worse in the 1930s. I think this new administration can make a break. One of the good things about Barack Obama, and I'll say it as a Republican, is he seems to be practical. He wants this thing to work, and he's not going to be rigid. Now, some experiments can go bad, but at least he's not going to go off a cliff saying, well, this is my theory. He's going to want what works. I hope you're right, Steve. Thank so you so much. Believe Thank you me. so much for being with us. Good to be with you. I Thank really you. appreciate it. One of the city's great cultural assets that is taking a huge hit is Broadway. Fourteen shows have closed or plan to close. Andrew Schmertz reports on what producers are doing to keep the shows going. At the TKTS booth in Times Square, it is definitely a buyer's market for Broadway theater tickets. I love going to Broadway shows, and I like to buy here at TKTS because you can see two or three shows that, for the price of what one of them might be. The theater is a central industry in New York City, Broadway is, and so like every other business in New York City, this is a very challenging time. The wonderful thing about the booth is that it's a day of outlet for the shows. Broadway producers have been aggressively cutting ticket prices even at the box office as they struggle to keep the seats filled in a down economy. I don't think it's hit Broadway quite as hard as it's hit some other New York industries. Obviously, Wall Street is at the epicenter of this. But there's no doubt that our attendance overall is down somewhere between 10,000 and 30,000 bodies a week from where it's been over the last three or four years. So we're going to wind up with about 13 fewer shows than we used to have. By the end of last year, more than a dozen shows either closed or announced they are closing, including Hairspray, Spamalot, Gypsy, and Young Frankenstein. According to the New York Times, even Broadway hits like Avenue Q are playing to nearly half-empty theaters. Broadway is facing a drop in tourists, a significant part of its customer base, and producers are finding they can no longer get ticket prices in the hundreds of dollars for seats. So Broadway veterans say producers need creative solutions to keep the theaters filled. Unless the theater industry takes a page from the airline industry and the hotel industry and begins to look at yield management, how do I put more people in the seats, what price point do I really have to get to, at what point in the, in the product life to fill that seat, unless it moves in that direction, it'll get left behind. It is a formula Disney employs. Pollard says Disney has kept shows like The Lion King and The Little Mermaid running by creatively pricing tickets in the marketplace. Recently, Disney began offering a kids go free ticket promotion. And some shows say they are doing just fine. Sherry, Sherry, the producers of Jersey Boys, the story of Frankie Valli and the Four Seasons, say they prepared for a recession by putting the show in a smaller venue. Our capacity and our operating costs are, um, uh, in, in, I think, in their own way, sort of designed for a moment just like this. We're uh, a medium-sized musical in a, in a wonderfully small, intimate musical house, and that's helpful with us, too. Our needs aren't to fill 2,000 seats. We fill 1,200 seats a night, and we've been able to do that. And so I think one shouldn't paint Broadway with a wide brush. There are wonderful shows here running healthfully. Theater veterans say one change you may see this year, fewer expensive musicals, and more serious plays. 
I'm Andrew Schmertz for It's the Economy New York. Coming up, his name is now as famous as Ponzi himself. We'll speak with forensic investigator Ellen Zimelis about what Bernie Madoff may have done with all that money. While Bernie Madoff remains holed up in his Upper East Side luxury apartment, many are wondering, how did he possibly steal $50 billion? And where did all that money go? Ellen Zimelis from Daylight Forensic and Advisory joins us. She's a former federal prosecutor who investigates securities and corporate fraud. Thank you so much for joining us, Ellen. My pleasure. So tell me, $50 billion, is this a real number? Do we believe it's really that much? We have no idea if it's less or more, frankly. Uh, we don't know if that, that $50 billion, it came right from Madoff. It hasn't been confirmed right. by anybody. And whether that includes sort of phantom profits. Right. So whether people actually lost that money or not is at issue. How long do you think this really went on? Was this something that really took a true Ponzi scheme for 50 years that he was able to pull off? Is this thing that happened over the last 10 or 5 years? How do you look at this? It seems like it may have gone on at least 10 years only because there were people who were questioning his strategy you know, in the late 90s. Right. So it looks like it might have gone on for there, but there are people who were investing with him, all, you know, for years and years, for over 40 years. And he always made that same, he always made, you know, around 11, 12 percent. Maybe in the beginning it actually was a little higher, mm -hmm. but it really settled into about 11 or 12 percent, no matter what happened in the market. Right. So it seems like it got on for a long time. So how, at this point, are we going to track the money? How did you track the money? Right. Um, well, there are two different issues. One is where it went, and what came in. And mm -hmm. you want to sort of figure out what, where it went and what came in. You also want to know if people, when they got what they thought was the interest or you know, payments, whether they reinvested it. Mm -hmm. So what, did that money go there or did, did it come out on redemptions? And it is a huge issue to sort of go in and out. Investors may have come in and then went out and then went back in again. So there's all, it is very complicated. There were about 8,000 claims that were sent out mm -hmm. to potential investors. So the civic trustee is going to have quite a job just straightening all this and out. And some of those investors who got their money back and actually may have made money, may now actually have to give it back. Yes, and it's petrifying that there are people who maybe had, had an investment, redeemed, mm -hmm. made some redemptions, and now there's something called a clawback, mm -hmm. where under New York law you could actually take, the trustee can come in and sue them and say, I want that money back that you redeemed. And who knows where they, if they even have that money anymore. And they certainly right. don't have any money that may have been left in. Right. When you think about Bernie Minoff, what kind of person typically does something like this? You know, it's funny. I have seen typical these schemes. Is a difficult word. It's, it, this is not typical. Right. Certainly, I, ha I had a Ponzi scheme that I investigated a few years ago, and it was $3 billion in yen trading, and I thought that was the biggest thing ever. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the individual involved in that was a little unusual as well. But this, this one is, is really um, sort of hard to get your arms around because there were people who he knew for years right. who were involved in this. People who he, you know, you would think he would be close to or his friends who have lost millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. So I don't know how a person can, how he can sleep at night knowing right. what he's done. And, and do you believe that he's done this alone? I mean, the sons have said that they don't know or they didn't understand what was going on. Right. Do we believe that? To actually orchestrate such a large scheme, how many people had to be involved? It certainly wasn't him alone. First of all, just the, the infrastructure of putting out the statements mm -hmm. requires a bunch of people. Requires, right. you know, computers and people looking at that and checking whether the, num the amount that they had for an option at the end of the day is consistent with the mm -hmm. true amount for that option. They, there was a lot of work that had to go into just the operations of this, uh, of this organization. So it's impossible that he did it alone. When you think about these feeder funds, people who are actually bringing investors into Madoff's fund. Right. Do you think that they knew that there was, even if they didn't know it was a Ponzi scheme, do you think they thought there was some, a problem? Were they complicit in this? Well, that will be a legal issue for a jury to tell, but the question is, what did they think was going on? I mean, they had a, a fiduciary, fiduciary obligation to their investors to understand what was happening, you know, in, in the Madoff investment. And for them just to sort of not look into it, others looked into it, Sokgen looked right. into it, this Markopoulos lo looked into it, and they all had questions about it. And so for them to just sort of move this money from their account to Madoff without really investigating is a breach of the fiduciary duty to the And then customer. what does that say about the SEC? We had whistleblowers that had gone to them before yeah. years and years and years ago and tried to speak very loudly and no one seemed to listen. Right. Look, there are some wonderful people at the SEC and some less than wonderful. And I think they are being investigated now by their own inspector general. Um, 
And I think there we will see what comes out of the SEC. The SEC has had a very tough year, let's put it that way, and it's just going to get tougher for them. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Oh, this is pleasure. fascinating. Great. Well, those who invested with Madoff are selling items with the Madoff logo on eBay. Tote bags, backpacks, and humidors are said to be going for, get this, $600 and up. And not everyone is a loser in this economy. Who are some of the recent winners? Well, soup is known as a comfort food. As it happens, soup maker Campbell's says that sales jumped 46% in its fiscal third quarter. And according to the New York Times, sales of the sleeping aid Ambien are said to be up 7% in New York. Antidepressants, a 5%. And bankruptcy is a good business if, well, you happen to be a lawyer. Leading attorney Harvey Miller of the law firm Weil Gottschall is not only handling the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, but has been hired to advise General Motors if they need his services. And finally, each week we'll ask you a question on our website and we'll report the results back the following week. This week, do you think the economy would be better served by A, cutting taxes on the middle class and small businesses, B, raising taxes to pay for the growing deficit, or C, keeping rates the same? Go to itstheeconomyny.org to give us your answer. And on next week's program, Daily News publisher Mort Zuckerman joins us. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin of the New York Times. We'll see you next week.